It's 10 minutes after 11 a.m. on the 7th of July, 2021. I was in this library once. It was in Austin. It's the actual archives of the state of Texas, but there's a variety of government documents in one of the rooms. Amongst those government documents are the official treaty documents of the United States of America. If I am correct, it goes back to the first formal printing of the Department of State, but even prior to that. It also has the book versions of treaties in force. I was there in May of 2018, and I looked through all the ones between around 1980 and what they had at the time, which was 2016. They did not at that time have the 2017 version. They did not at that time have the 2018 version, at least not on the shelves. They had the versions, the actual book versions, up through 2016. I saw a number of things. I made very comprehensive notes about that. Uh, unfortunately, it is what it is in terms of the status of those specific original notes. But among the things that I saw and that I recorded in my notes were the specific countries the United States had a treaty arrangement with concerning loans involving military naval vessels, specifically submarines, but in a few cases there were also destroyers. The United States had specific arrangements uh, going back to the time frame of the late 1940s through early 1960s with a majority of them within a specific three-year period, or at least being commenced within a specific three-year period during the 1950s, where the United States would agree to loan out between one and three military vessels to certain countries. I remember certain countries very specifically. By and large, it was two submarines per country. The exception was West Germany. The relationship the United States had with West Germany, on the contrary, had to do with restitution for damages incurred at the port. Now, I had all of these listed in the notes. These were in the formal versions in the 2016 edition of Treaties in Force, these specific uh, treaties or these specific uh, agreements were in the actual book copy and were referenced. I looked up the primary uh, document uh, for a number of those countries and saw that it was pretty consistently uh, very much the same, except uh, some minor changes depending upon the specific country. There were more than 50 countries perhaps as many as 80, that the United States had these kind of arrangements with. And the ironic thing is not all of these countries even had a coastline. Now, not all of these countries even had a continental coastline. So I compared and cross-referenced this with other information that uh, I found uh, that fit into what I understood as the same pattern. And I became concerned that these military naval vessels were actually more a part of some kind of intelligence strategy or alleged intelligence strategy. And there's a significant difference between loaning out a destroyer and loaning out a submarine. There's also a very specific uh, difference in terms of understanding that a maritime vessel does not necessarily always have to fly the flag of the country that is the one from whence it has originated. And the question becomes, how much of these loners on submarines are about maritime law or about the laws of war? Well, when you're talking about them being brokered through the Department of State, that makes a very significant difference as far as I'm concerned. In the late 1990s, in the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill, there is a line item regarding reprogramming of previously laid out destroyers in that they were reprogrammed to be submarines. Now, one can argue, if you've actually undergone a 10 to 20 year process 
regarding outlets for a naval destroyer. How does one, after an approximately five to ten year process, decide all of a sudden, well, it's not going to be a destroyer anymore, it's going to be a submarine. If we're talking about literal construction of an actual tangible asset in the form of an actual military vessel. An actual military naval vessel with all that goes into that, including how you construct it, what you put on it, all of these factors, five to 10 years after the original outlay, it's being reprogrammed as a completely different military naval vessel. I learned last night that the year before I was in Texas, while I was on the streets of Chicago, that there was an effort that had been formally engaged by a woman who was an attorney in Texas in order to attempt to submit grievances and to follow through on allegations of fraud and even significant crimes committed by members of the State Bar of Texas, or rather the Texas Bar Association, specifically in relationship for the uh, commission, for, uh, the, uh, the disciplinary commission, which is abbreviated as CDC. In fact, if you read through some of what she's written, it makes sense for her to use the abbreviation CDC or OCDC. But not so ironically, the time frames and the dates and the times on her grievances or her e formal efforts to contact members of the State Bar of Texas and others involved with the administration of justice, including justice that would be responsible for assuring that members of the government were not abusing their office, including the judicial branch of government, correlated with efforts I was making in Chicago, specifically efforts I was making in Chicago to expose and seek redress for fraud in homeless and domestic violence shelters. It was seeing to it that staff members were intentionally violating policy in what appeared to be an effort to recruit or compel people to agree to cooperate with ulterior motives they had on their political agenda. And in the course of that, engaging in what were actually illegal actions in connection with their qualification to receive funding through federal appropriations for the specific job that they had in that domestic or homeless shelter, the domestic violence or homeless shelter. The time and dates on the uh, majority of those grievances and the time frame wherein that specific aspect started was once I had taken for myself the action of taking it out of the local shelter system and attempting to seek redress through a formal process first through the state of Illinois. Around that time, I was evicted in what turned out was a correlation with, at least at the time, an announcement that the Internal Revenue Service had shut down a nonprofit organization associated with the Episcopal Royalty Trust. Now, the Episcopal Royalty Trust is specifically referenced in the 1986 tax code when it comes to subsidies for the gas and oil sector in the United States. For two years, information was available online concerning this IRS action against the Episcopal Royalty Trust. I have not been able to find that information since. I believe these events are directly correlated. Did somebody make that attorney her, their submarine? Was she supposed to be their submarine? Were they pinging her? And was she responding? And did they just ignore her for years and not provide any feedback and not provide any confirmation on the literal legal processes 
she was engaged in and exposing because they had already assigned her as a State Department asset for somebody attempting to claim they had the authority of the Department of State to torture her. What she reveals is that she was tortured. She was tortured in some sort of process that has no constitutional authority. And even if somebody wanted to say they were engaged in some sort of diplomatic mission where the United States national security or cooperation the United States was engaged with with another country in pursuit of their national security allowed for them to do this. The truth of the matter is what they did is they targeted a whistleblower who just a very cursory viewing of what she was exposing had absolutely had legal standing. She was absolutely justified to pursue a legitimate course of ordinary political process in order to receive acknowledgement that if nothing else, she had been put into a position where she was an accomplice witness to serious crime. And if this witnessing of crime involves people, including alleged state actors, attempting to abuse their political office or some other access they have, including to the financial system, in order to undermine the morale or loyalty of the military by engaging in simulations of legal process involving military assets, we're talking about sedition. And if they're using that to commit fraud involving underwriting on municipal bonds when they misrepresent the actual financial status of the municipality, or they attempt to cover up for efforts to expose crime within the municipality, it is to the letter of the law sedition. There is no immunity. There's no constitutional cover for torturing your own people to try to get away with fraud. And it doesn't matter even if you're a justice of the Supreme Court of the state of Texas, a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, or the president of the United States, much less anybody else. Now, when I was in Houston, I had an understanding that after my first year of illegal debt service to the Houston Police Department, I was supposed to be dead. And they had already found my replacement. That woman identified herself as a member of the Longshoremen's Union. She was signed up to be made a submarine for the police pension fund in Houston the year they were updating the transportation workers identification credential database. And now we have COVID-19. Who did you let flag you as a submarine? Every member of the Texas legislature, every Texan is a member of the federal legislature, everybody in executive office and everybody with a fucking bar card for the state bar of Texas. Who did you let flag you to be their submarine? This is not proxy warfare. You are not constitutionally covered. You have 72 hours to review and reveal your flag. Every one of you must reveal your flag within 72 hours. It is 11.24 a.m. July 7, 2021. 